Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we are going to share the story of the history of the three-point line. If you are 40 years old or younger, then the three-point line has always been a part of the NBA. In fact, it's been there since before you were born. Most fans today just take it for granted that the line has always been there. But like most everything else having to do with basketball, it has a beginning that we can point to. Most basketball history aficionados like me like to point to the old ABA for the start of the three-point line, but the guys that ran the ABA actually got the idea from an older league. Now this is a story that most fans are probably not familiar with. So let me take you all the way back to where the three-point line really started. For that, I have to take you back to 1960 and to a guy named Abe Saperstein. If you are a regular listener to this show, then you have heard me mention Saperstein before. He is the man credited with the founding of the Harlem Globetrotters back in the 1920s. We explored that story way back in episode 10 called Globetrotters Origin Story. In that episode, we covered Abe Saperstein's backstory and how he came to be involved with the Globetrotters. Before we keep going, I want to address something. In that episode, I kept pronouncing Saperstein as Saperstein. The reason I did that is very simple. That is the correct phonetic pronunciation of that name, just like Albert Einstein. In the German language, when you see the letters E and I in that order, it is pronounced I, Einstein, or Saperstein. However, since I did that episode, I have done more research and have come across many old audio interviews of people that knew him or worked for him, and they consistently pronounce his name as Saperstein. I am a big believer that people are allowed to pronounce their own name however they want. So from now on, I will go with Saperstein. So back to this story. Saperstein has been running the Globetrotters very successfully for over 30 years, and he wanted to get back into regular competitive basketball. There really was no room for him in the NBA since there was no one who wanted to sell their team at the time. He probably would not have done very well as an NBA owner because he would not get to call his own shots. Every major decision would have to be run by the other owners. That was not Saperstein's style. So, he came up with the idea of forming a second league to compete with the NBA. He called it the American Basketball League, or ABL. Now, this is not to be confused with an older league that played under that same name in the 1920s and 1930s. These are two separate enterprises that just happened to share the same name. For this new league, Saperstein organized eight teams to play in the inaugural season. Those teams were located in Los Angeles, Chicago, Honolulu, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. But that team in Hawaii was a curious one. Flying to and from Hawaii was really expensive. The Hawaii team would have to fly to the mainland for every one of their road games. Back then, it took over six hours just to fly from Hawaii to Los Angeles or San Francisco, their closest opponents. To get from Honolulu to Washington, D.C. back then was two flights and nearly 12 hours in the air. Financially speaking, playing in Hawaii makes no sense. That is still why there is no major professional team in Hawaii today. It is simply too far away from everyone else in the league. Now, this league filled their rosters with NBA castoffs. 
It was either older NBA veterans who just wanted to keep playing somewhere, or young guys who could not quite make it onto an NBA roster. Or in the case of Connie Hawkins, he had nowhere else to go since he was banned by the NBA for not reporting a bribe attempt while he was in college. That story was part of the famous 1960 college basketball betting scandal, which I will go into more deeply in a future episode, but it is not to be confused with the 1951 betting scandal, which I covered back in episode 14. Now, I don't want to get too far off the story of the three-point line, so let's get back to that. This new league, the ABL, introduced the very first three-point line in proper competitive basketball history. Saperstein had this idea that he had been toying with with the Globetrotters and he wanted to bring it to competitive basketball. Any shot taken from more than 25 feet away from the basket would be worth three points. Saperstein wanted something to get the fans excited and the three-point line worked. Both the players and the fans thought it was a great idea. It was a huge hit. But Saperstein did not come up with the idea himself. He was a guy that was always in the know about how basketball was developing and he would take the best ideas and try to apply them to the Globetrotters. The three-point line was first tested in a practice game between Columbia University and Fordham University in 1945, but nothing ever came of it. In 1958, they tried it again in a practice game between St. Francis University and Siena College, but again, Nothing came of it. Saperstein's league was the first league to make the three-point line an official part of the game. Unfortunately, we have virtually no records left from the ABL other than the team's wins and losses. So I wish I could give you more detail, but most of them are simply lost. Also, the league itself would not last very long. Their one and only champion was the Cleveland Pipers. The league would open play for a second season, but went completely out of business before that second season could be completed. At the time, it would have been a safe bet that the three-point line would disappear along with the ABL itself. Now, this is a good place to take a break, and I will be right back with how the ABA took the three-point line to new heights. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let's continue with the history of the three-point line. As I mentioned, the idea of the three-point line was created by a league called the ABL, founded by Abe Saperstein, who owned the Harlem Globetrotters. Five years after that league went out of business, a new group of owners started the ABA, the American Basketball Association, to compete directly with the NBA. The reason for why they started this new upstart league is one that I discussed more fully back in episode 29, the billion dollar contract. So go and check that out if you're interested in hearing that story. As the ABA was being founded, they knew that they had to make a splash and they also needed to be taken seriously. They hired George Mikan to be their first league commissioner. At the time, in 1967, George Mikan was still considered the greatest player in NBA history. He brought instant credibility to this new league. As a new league, they knew that they had to differentiate themselves from the older and established NBA. They could not just change the game completely, but they did have to make a few rule changes that would make their brand of basketball exciting and more fun to watch. One of their first decisions was to go with the red, white, and blue basketball. It looked great on TV, and it allowed the viewer at home to better see the movement of the ball. Remember that back in the late 1960s, most families still owned a black and white television. The multicolored ball made it easier to see on TV. The next idea was the three-point line. The ABA leadership was familiar with this idea since it was just used five years earlier by Saperstein and the ABL, and they thought it would be a great addition to the new ABA. It was an incentive for players to practice and perfect long-range shooting. Fans loved it, just like in the ABL. Getting three points for a long shot brought big cheers from the crowd. In other words, the three-point line was a huge hit with ABA fans as well. It also created a brand of basketball that was more guard-oriented, much like today's NBA, as opposed to the center-dominated style that you found in the NBA back then. The ABA was a faster-paced game with higher scoring. When the ABA merged with the NBA in 1976, the NBA decided not to use the three-point line. 
they viewed it as a gimmick and did not think it would be right for this more established and traditional NBA. But just three years later, the NBA reversed course and introduced the three-point line for the 1979-1980 season. The first NBA player to make a three-pointer was Chris Ford of the Boston Celtics. The Celtics were playing one of the early games on opening night. The shot proved so popular that the NBA introduced the three-point contest during All-Star Weekend starting in 1986, and they have put it on ever since. Larry Bird won the first three editions of the contest, including the one in 1988 where he points his finger up in victory while the last shot was still in the air. I'll put a link to that video in the description for you. But even though the three-point line was in use for years, NBA coaches still did not use it that much. You would think that with 1980s shooters like Larry Bird, Chuck Person, Dale Ellis, and other elite shooters, that they would have made more use of the three-point line. But the coaches of the 1980s were mostly guys who came up in the 1950s and 1960s. Being led by old school coaches, it was rare for a team in the 1980s to shoot a three-pointer unless they needed to catch up quickly or the shot was super wide open. Danny Ainge, the current president of the Celtics, was a player for the Celtics back in the 1980s. One day, he did some very simple math and realized that they could increase their scoring by shooting more three-pointers. Back in 1985, the Celtics, as a team, took an average of 90 shots per game, not counting the free throws, just regular shots. They shot 51.5% from the two-point range, meaning that for every 90 shots they took from the two-point area, they would score 93 points. But they shot 35.6% from three-point range, meaning that for every 90 shots they took from three-point range, they would score 96 points. That is three extra points per game if they shot nothing but three-pointers. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into the analytics and all of that about what it means to score three extra points per game. I'll just keep it very simple. Increasing the team scoring by three points per game results in six extra wins per season. Six extra wins is a lot in the NBA. It can mean the difference between being the four seed and the one seed going into the playoffs. Ainge tried hard to convince the coaches and the rest of the team that they were better off shooting nothing but three-pointers but they were just too stuck in their ways back then. This was a team with Larry Bird, and for the 1985 season, they averaged only four shots per game from behind the three-point line. Four shots per game. Again, not four makes from the three, four attempts. And they only made one per game on average. Think about that for a moment. A team that had Larry Bird only averaged one three-pointer per game. Sometimes it just takes a while for things to catch on. Now let us fast forward to today where we see guys like Steph Curry, Damian Lillard, Clay Thompson, Trey Young, and others are making three-pointers the way other players make layups. Today every team in the league has a team of math PhDs who go deep into the analytics to uncover stuff like this. The math clearly shows that it makes more sense to shoot three-pointers than two-pointers. In 2021, the NBA as a league averages 53% from two-point range, which means that for every 100 shots, the team will score 106 points. But the league also averages 36.7% from three-point range, which means for those same 100 shots, if they took them from three, the team would score 110 points. That's four extra points per 100 shots, which is why today the league averages 35 attempts from three-point range per game, with a couple of teams averaging 40-plus three-point attempts per game. I think it is safe to say that the three-point shot is here to stay. There is even talk every now and then of using the half-court line as a four-point line, meaning that any shot taken from the backcourt would be worth four points. So, who knows what's going to happen. Maybe 10 years from now, we're going to be talking about the four-pointer. Now what we do know is that the three-point line has opened up the game in ways we have never seen before. Curry and Lillard have to be picked up at half court because they are a threat to shoot from anywhere in the front court. I believe we are only going to see more guys like them entering the league every year. So there you have it. There is the story of how the three-point line came to be and how it has changed the game for more efficient scoring. 
Join us next time as we dive into the story of James Naismith. We already know that he invented the game of basketball, but in the next episode, we are going to go into his upbringing and how he came to be at the school where his amazing idea took place. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find the podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There, you will find shorter historical posts, as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care, and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.